Uh, we're live. Uh, what we're doing tonight is having a local election night featuring our local candidates. Uh, as many of you know, uh, especially in social media, <coughs> there's been a, uh, a UN cry that the Greens uh, should focus on local campaigns because uh, uh, on social media we tend to hear a lot about our presidential campaigns. Of course, social media is is a sort of national and international thing. Uh, but we actually have have many local candidates uh, around the country. Uh, I can't speak for other states, but uh, in New York alone, we have 35 local races. And actually, quite a number of them are, are partisan as well. Uh, it, so some of the, uh, uh, in an off election year like this, uh, some of the races tend to be town council or mayoral races, uh, sometimes county legislative. Uh, but in some areas, like New York, many of those races are partisan and some are not. Uh, most of these races around the country are not partisan. But of course, uh, the candidates who are here tonight are Greens and have been active Greens. Uh, Co-hosting with me. Uh, I'm Craig Seaman, as you can see by the title. Uh, Co-hosting with me is Starling Rankin, also of the Media Committee. And with that, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself and introduce our first guest. You're live, Starling. You're live, Starling. Well, I guess Starlene isn't live yet. Uh, uh, so, uh, <coughs> yes, the uh, question is, uh, is Howie running? Yes, Howie is running for city auditor in Syracuse. Uh, and that is a partisan position. In fact, uh, Syracuse is running, uh, Syracuse Greens are running several candidates, uh, and Syracuse, like New York, are one of those cities where uh, all the city races are actually partisan races. Uh, another way, race to watch in uh, Syracuse is Frank Zatera, and he'll be on later, who's running for... Uh, Common Council, also known as City Council, by uh, by most people, how most people understand the term. Uh, I'd point out that many of these local offices go under different names. Uh, there are city and town councils. Sometimes they are referred to as Common Council uh, in some cities. Uh, with that, uh, I believe Starlene is ready. Are you ready, Starlene? And yes, uh, we'll take uh, Starlene live and she'll introduce herself, Starlene, who's on the media committee with me, and she'll introduce our first guest. You're live, Starlene. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Uh, yeah, I'm Starlene Rankin. I'm out in Portland, California. I'm really happy you all are watching our election night show tonight. I'm so excited to get to talk to a whole bunch of our green candidates this evening. And I know they're all excited, too, to see how the results turn out this evening. Um, our first guest is Rashad Turner, and he's running for a school board in St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, Rashad, uh, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Hey, good evening. Thank you all for having me. Sure. Um, so are you at an election night party right now? We're having a little election night party here in the uh, Ferns. It's in our neighborhood right in St. Paul, uh, one of our local spots that was a lot of time there campaigning and doing a lot of work for our campaign. So, kind of have a little fun. Okay. Maybe you could hold your microphone a little closer to your. Yeah, so we can hear you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, that's okay. Was this your first time running for office? Yeah, this is my first time. Um, I've learned a lot of things 
Uh, I, I got into the race because my community sort of gave me the support that I felt uh, I needed. Uh, they were very adamant about me getting into this school board race, so I, I stepped up to the plate at the right end. It's been fun. It's been a lot of hard work, but a lot of good people. and learned a ton of things along the way. Awesome. I know the Greens are very active in Minnesota, and especially in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So you're with a great group of folks. I have a lot great. of friends there. Yeah. Uh, what time do your polls close tonight? Our polls close at eight o'clock, so we probably got just about about forty minutes to go. Forty anxious. Minutes. Forty minutes. You're excited, I know. Very excited. <laughs> tell me a little. Um, tell me a little bit about your. Oh, go no, ahead. Go ahead. Okay, tell me a little about your your no, strip. Your strategy, uh, did you do door knocking or street corners or public events? How did you do outreach? So, so being a green, um, you know, we obviously are not interested in getting that big corporate money and those things of that nature. So we definitely did a lot of uh, door knocking. I think in the past two months we have distributed about 15,000 15, pieces of literature. So it's been a lot of getting on the ground, knocking on doors, handing out flyers. And just having an opportunity to talk to the people and let them sort of, you know, feel the passion that I have for working with students and doing what's best for our community. How did people find, uh, how do they feel about a, 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 an alternative party candidate? Because I'm sure there, uh, I should ask, uh, I'm sure there are a number of candidates running in this race. Or uh, How do they feel about you or the Green Party, as, as you may have identified yourself, uh, were they positive that you were running, or did they feel like, you know, why are you here, you know? Uh, I'm curious, what was I the public think, reaction? I think the response was very positive. Um, in St. Paul, we have a, pretty much a one-party town, so I think just to uh, throw a green into the mix and sort of change the dynamics of the race and disrupt the status quo of what we see here in St. Paul, so I think the response has been great. Um, I know before I got in as a write-in candidate, I know that a lot of people were like, hey, you know, don't run as a green. It sort of splits people up or alienates people. But I've actually seen the exact opposite. I've seen a lot of Democrats, you know, coming up, saying good things, um, showing a lot of support. So I think the Green Party's heading in the right direction. Um, a lot of the issues we deal with here in St. Paul are social justice issues, environmental issues, things of that nature. So I think that the Green Party... This fits right in perfectly here in St. Paul. Uh, since, since that's part of the country, has had a, a fairly active uh, Green Party, uh, and as those people uh, who are listening may not be aware of, um, uh, Cam Gordon uh, is from that area. So, so there's a sense that you know you're not alone in that, and that they haven't. An understanding that there's, you know, Greens can get elected. Uh, oh yeah, Cam Cam's been doing great work in Minneapolis, and, and like I said, St. Paul is a, is a one-party town, so it's really about just sort of changing that dynamic, changing the status quo around here, because obviously with the one-party system, one-party town, not too much is being done. So we need to change that as Greens. I think the response has been great. People are really excited about this election. I think excited about the future and having the Green Party here and such a strong presence here in Minnesota. Uh, um, go ahead, Starley. Oh, Rashad, what are some of the things you would do if you get elected for the, the, the kids in St. Paul? If I get elected, I'm going to try to get about eight hours of sleep in a row, just for starters. <laughs> But then uh, <laughs> I'll take off in January, but I would definitely be reaching out to different schools in the community just to sort of get a feel of what they need in the immediate, what I need to be ready for on day one sitting in that seat. Excellent. Yeah. <clears throat> Our schools need a lot of help right now, as we all know. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, the disparities here at St. Paul Public Schools are similar to the disparities across the country mm -hmm. and you know they're, they're Minnesota nice thing that everybody talks about but when it comes to issues of social justice and how our students are treated inside of the schools I like to say it's Minnesota ice mm -hmm. right. 
Do you yeah. have children yourself? Yeah, I've got a, a beautiful seven-year-old daughter. Uh, she attends school oh, here nice. in St. Paul. So it, it was great to have her at a few of the debates and the forums because I think it really allows the people to have, you know, so it gives me a little bit uh, greater responsibility um, as far as trying to do the right things for students. But definitely right, more exactly. familiar being that I have my own. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure she's one of your biggest supporters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's got me wrapped around her face. So, yeah. <laughs> That's the way it should be. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about uh, the challenges of school board in St. Paul, because I know New York City no longer has an elected school board. They got rid of that some years ago. But uh, one of the issues happening here, and I'm curious something like that is happening, we have a, a Democratic governor uh, who's pushing charter schools. And a, a, as you know, that that's actually quite devastating to the public school system. Uh, what are the things that are, that, are, that are devastating your school system that you're fighting? Are there any big battles that you see? What, what there is that push that's coming through town, and there, there's a lot of talk, a lot of different corporate organizations that are really trying to focus on privatizing the public school system um, through charter schools. So we've been battling that for probably the past six months. Um, out in Minneapolis, they pretty much paid for the election a few years ago to try to kind of push that agenda. So we're quite aware of that. Um, a lot of different nonprofit organizations sort of organizing to keep that from happening. But as far as the school board, um, one of the things that I think that, you know, we battle here in St. Paul is that our school board members are part-time. So I think that if we could do more to kind of spend more time working in the area of education, I think we could get our district heading in the right direction. And that's one of the biggest reasons I ran, uh, not only for the but to make sure that our students have the best opportunity going forward. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you that you mentioned that because you you're mentioning that that that, that you're in a one party town, and, and so and the charter school issue and those and those kinds of issues often are just as severe when the Democrats are in control. There's sort of a sense of you know let's blame the Republicans, but in New York it's also uh, the Democrats who who are pushing that kind of thing. So. Uh, uh, what have you done to, to differentiate yourself? How, how do, you, do Have you had to explain what the Green Party is or, and, and how important it would be to public education? Um, for me, you know, I'm one of the organizers for Black Lives Matter St. Paul, so we have a very strong presence in our community. So I think that the, the work I do in the community with Black Lives Matter St. Paul is right in line or right aligned with, you know, the mission of the Green Party. So I think that our community is, is getting more and more active. We're finding the voice in our community. And the Green Party, honestly, has been a major, major part of sort of stirring things up in the community and getting people to understand that although we're currently a one-party town, there are people here, there is the Green Party, and, and we're looking to change that and, and really do what's best. I mean, when you look at St. Paul in general, our, our education system, like I mentioned the disparities earlier, but pretty much everything in St. Paul when it comes to communities of color, when it comes to the injustices that communities of color face, the Green Party is fighting every day hard for that. And I think that a lot of people are starting to wake up and things are gonna change up here in St. Paul and I hope uh -oh. I hope I hope they do out in New York as well. Sorry about that. <laughs> your, your guest wow. Brandon Long, he actually made a good catch. So remind him of <laughs> comes. I see Brandon's logged on on another computer. Yeah. Wow, you're Brandon, really Brandon's inspiring. been great. Sean. Brandon's been re really great as far as getting the Green Party going up here. Um, very strong mm -hmm. media presence, and, and just being able to kind of get that message out. So I, I was honored to get the Green Party endorsement. Mm -hmm. And going to continue to work hard. And well, let's um. Thank you so much for being on, and uh, good luck tonight. Thank you. I hope you get elected. 
Appreciate and it. I hope you'll try again if you don't. <laughs> um, let's do. Yeah. Great. Um, let's move over to Brandon. Have a fun time tonight, Rashad. Yeah, have a good Celebrate. night. Celebrate. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Brandon, are you there? She's asking if you're here to see this channel. Where? 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 All right. And we didn't we didn't tell him to <laughs> disconnect. <laughs> Brandon, are you there? Uh oh. Uh I think oh no, he he was there a moment ago. He's still online. Oh, he just dropped off. <laughs> Alright, well let's go to Hillary. Hillary, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. No video tonight, just your picture? Well, I can turn on video and I can't seem to figure out how to change my webcam so that it's facing me and not facing the wall. Oh. So <laughs> while I figure that out, uh, you can look at my picture instead. Oh, sorry. I'm doing the picture thing tonight, too. So, how are things going? Going good. We just started the show. Uh, everybody, this is Hillary Kane. She's one of the co-chairs of the uh, Coordinated Campaign Committee, which is our national committee that handles everything around elections and campaigns and that sort of thing. And um, been really, really busy this year getting ready. Oh, hey, Brandon. Hey, there yeah. we go. Oh, there you go. So why don't we have, we'll just have Brandon and Hillary on at the same time. I think that'll work. Can you get them both on the screen, Craig? We do have to switch back and forth probably. Oh, probably doesn't. Yeah. Okay. What? You can do Brandon first and then me. I can switch back and forth. Okay. All right, well, let's go ahead and do Brandon since uh, he's at a party and probably wants to relax. With us, Hillary. Brandon, are you there? Hello. Brandon, can you hear us? <laughs> oh, no. We should just have him sit in front of Rashad's camera. Hey, your microphone's not working, Brandon, I don't think. Can I just use yours? Oh, wait, there you go. Say something, Brandon. Now oh, this is really weird. All right. All right, let's go back to Hillary. Okay. You're back, Hillary. So tell us um, a little bit about what the uh, Coordinating Campaign Committee has been working on and what they're thinking about for next year. Sure. So I co-chair uh, the Coordinated Campaign Committee, also known as the CCC. And we're a committee of the Green Party of the United States. So at the national level, we're made up of members from all over the country. And our task is really to support candidates and campaigns. And so we've been doing that a number of ways. We've been hosting monthly webinars or conference calls that discuss different campaign issues. So kind of taking the campaign school concept and making it virtual. Um, we record all those calls. So we nice have, now have a nice archive of material and advice to give any future candidates. Um, we've also been tasked with developing a national electoral strategy. So um, what's not maybe known to a lot of people is that we don't really have 
an electoral strategy in the Green Party, aside from just, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, so to speak, no pun intended to our sunflower. Um, you know, it sort of has been a scattershot approach, and in the spirit moves people, and they run for office, it's great, and we support them, but there's not a distinct strategy where we're saying, as a party, we want to focus our efforts in this direction, um, whatever that direction is. And so we are now trying to figure out what that might look like without being too prescriptive, because we're still very much a bottoms-up, grassroots party, but we want to have a sense of what, what limited resources we do have at the national level, how can we um, use them more effectively and more strategically? So after some searching and thinking about different types of strategies, everything from what I'll call the all eggs in one basket strategy, where we say, okay, our goal this year is gonna be, let's say, to elect someone to Congress, and all around the country, we're gonna focus on that. Or it could have been a strategy that was maybe geographic. We're gonna do on urban areas or rural areas or we're going to focus on the top five states or something like that. What we ultimately came up with was what we call an issue-based strategy. So I'm on with the next. Right. some Here's number funny. of issues, yeah, um, it's a technical I think we're going to pick four, <laughs> but picking some number of issues where we really focus uh, our energy on attracting candidates that support that issue, um, raising that issue up in campaigns across the country, um, developing solid platforms and talking points for candidates, building our expertise, and also mobilizing and connecting with activist networks that already support that issue. So, for example, you know, we could do an issue strategy around um, fracking. So that's like an issue that's big in a lot of states, maybe not every state, um, and a lot of Green Party chapters, Pennsylvania, where I'm from, New York, um, all a lot of the Green parties in the country have come out really strong against fracking and expanding fracking. And so we could have, you know, a separate website that's, you know, Greens against fracking. We would profile any candidates that made that maybe their top three issues. We would put support out there, new news media releases, and then we'd also be able to get people involved in campaigns who maybe are in a state where they don't have a local candidate or they're in a, you know, a town where no one's running that year. And so we think this is a way to sort of bring our two halves together, the electoral arm and the sort of more movement advocacy issue arm, and really, um, you know, chart a new course. So we're going to be um, taking the four pillars, so grassroots democracy, ecology, nonviolence, and social justice, and trying to pick an issue that kind of fits in each one of those four areas and roll that out next year and hopefully have you know, more candidates running, a stronger messaging, better connection to voters, um, and also really move the needle on some issues. So that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, that's great. I'm so excited about launching, you know, this whole campaign. It's going to be great. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I guess we'll go to Brandon now. Thank you so much, Hillary, for giving us that little uh, introduction about what's happening with electoral strategy for next year. And I'm sure we'll hear more from you, you know, as time goes on <laughs> and uh, from your and your committee, too. And you guys are doing great work. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> if you want to hang on, you can stick around if you want to stay on the in the yeah, hangout. Sure. And, you know. Okay, yeah, we might appreciate your comments on things. Okay, let's sure. go. So, um, Brandon, you need to unmute yourself within the Hangout. Yeah, there you go. Hi. Oh, whoops. Not getting your audio. Hello? Oh, there it is. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, good, good. Hi, finally. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. That's okay. So, everybody, this is Brandon Long. He's one of the spokespeople for uh, the Minnesota Green Party. We're so happy you're with us tonight, Brandon. Um, yeah, thanks why for don't you tell us? Yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the exciting campaigns that you've been helping with there in Minnesota? And, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, we're really excited. We had four campaigns this year um, that were really centered around specific sort of justice issues. Um, you know, they had broader platforms, but 
I think what highlighted us uh, against you know Democrat candidates were things like 15 now, um, Trahern Cruz for city council in St. Paul. That was a big issue for him. Um, up in Duluth, you had Chris Osbuchen, who is very strong against the poly met copper, um, with pristine boundary waters. Um, you had Black Lives leaders like uh, Rashad that you just spoke to, um, talking about racial equity in our schools. You had um, Andy Schuler in Golden Valley, who uh, really made uh, genuine progress indicator, really, really, real true indicators of our of our progress. His his main focus, uh, ecology issues. He's he's uh, cross endorsed with the marijuana now and the ecology democracy party as well. So you know, we a really broad range of issues, uh, really important issues that aren't being touched by the Democrats or the Republicans. Um, so that's what makes us really excited about those this year. Hey, and you'll have even more candidates next year, right? Yeah, you know, um, I think I believe it's I can't remember what the target for the U.S. is, but we're hoping that we meet our quota for that. Um, we're, what we're really trying to think about right now is elections that uh, are important to Greens and elections that would be strategic to win um, and I think something uh, seats that really fill those requirements are soil and water uh, apparently there are many many soil and water seats that go unopposed that get appointed um, and this is really this should be our wheelhouse you see Republicans going after uh, school board seats um, and this would be a genuine a genuine move for us too it wouldn't be just strategic but it would also sort of meet that ability to uh, run campaigns, learn some, learn how to campaign, have some tangible wins, while also uh, putting greens in seats that are really important, that really affect our communities. So we're, we're sort of hoping that we'll have about 20 um, candidates, at least for soil and water. Uh, there will be, I'm sure, city council, state rep um, candidates that will come forward, but a lot of our organizing efforts, I think, will go into that strategy, and I think it's a really good strategy, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited. I every state. Whoops. Are you still there? Yep, I'm here. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm really excited because every state that I talk to is just saying they're going to have you know as many candidates as possible running, and uh, I think we're going to break our records for the number of candidates next year. Yeah, absolutely, um, and I think. I think the, the, the odds are really in our favor. I mean, not only do people appreciate our policies um, and identify with them more than they do with the other two major parties, uh, but we really, we're really getting at that grassroots level, and I think that, you know, inevitably, it's just inevitable. You see these tides in England and in Canada, um, all over the world, so it's just it's, it's time for the U.S. Greens, and I think that time's now. Brandon, let me exactly. ask... Exactly. Let me ask, what, what is the ballot status in Minnesota? In Minnesota? Do you have ballot line, or is that one of your we objectives? We do. Yeah, you know what, we do, and I wish I could give you more specifics. There's others in the party that are a little bit more familiar with the specifics, but I will say that um, it is one of the harder states to, to gain ballot access. Uh, we just recently regained minor party status. Um, to, to regain major party status and to have some of that guaranteed ballot access, we would have to get... Um, you know, we'd have to get 5% um, in any statewide election. So so it is tough. The, the reason, part of the, the, the thinking behind the soil and water as well, not only is it a, a good idea, it's where we should be, you know, it's, a, it's a good seat to target, is that you don't have some of those onerous ballot access requirements. Um, I don't, I, I believe you just have to pay a fee. I don't even believe that there's um, a number of signatures that you have to gain, so. So in addition, you know, we'll we'll be going after. We won't have uh, quite the same um, really nice city council seats to go after next time, only because um, St. Paul and Minneapolis won't be up next year, where we have ranked choice voting. Hopefully, we will have ranked choice voting here soon in Duluth. Uh, Greens were instrumental in in um, putting that on the ballot. That was on the ballot this this election tonight. So, um, you know, elect electoral reforms like that make make things a lot easier for us, and I it's just more democratic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've been hearing about a lot of different local parties that are and state parties working on um, getting ranked choice voting passed. You know, not you, in the city, you know, at least in the whole state. Did you find any opposition to that? Were there, were there? 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. So all of the major incumbents in Duluth, all the city council members and the mayor, um, they all came out against ranked choice voting. They said, you know, what works in St. Paul wouldn't work here. What um, they, you know, this, the, we want the primary system. It's democratic. It was, there was a, there was a definite coordinated campaign against ballot, um, against the ranked choice voting. All, even though um, a task force um, from that city council recommended it overwhelmingly. So it was very telling that the establishment just, they, they saw the writing on the wall and they saw that it didn't serve them. It served democracy um, and they acted in kind really. So, so did you have a, a counter strategy? Cause I know, cause, cause wherever that's uh, any kind of uh, electoral reform happens, It's nothing. How do you? Uh... Yeah, you know, we sent out a mail, an email yesterday to our supporters, to our Duluth Greens, from our city council member and mini council, um, explaining uh, not only his, his opinion on the matter, but the fact that the voters were not they wanted to keep it, and they overwhelmingly said yes. So um, those arguments are just. I think is. already rejected that argument. St. Paul already rejected that argument. So it's a matter of time. And, and of course, with ranked choice vo voting, it, it does increase the likelihood of, of green candidates uh, winning local office, uh, since there's a, the, it, it decreases the fear of, you know, vote for somebody. Do I put in somebody else in? <laughs> you know, somebody else in office. Exactly. Uh, have they used, in any of the campaigns you, you've been involved in this year that you've seen, have there been any fear tactics about, you know, voting for, for the green candidate might put in an unwanted candidate? Is that a, something you've um, seen? You know what? It, it actually is really interesting with Trey Hearn's um, campaign, uh, not so much uh, fear tactics as there was a weird reaction. You had three candidates vying for the Democrat endorsement in Ward 1, um, and as soon as... Um, as soon as it was clear that there would be no endorsement, um, the incumbent, um, they, they, they had an extra endorsing meeting where they endorsed the incumbent um, for fear of losing to our green candidate since he was up against the other, the other two candidates had dropped out as independents. So um, there's a real, you know, there's a real strength here in Minnesota for the Greens. Um, there's a lot of people that identify with us and they know this and they're afraid of it. So we really clearly saw that in Ward 1 here in St. Paul. And of course ranked choice voting would would help in such uh, <laughs> in such campaigns. Uh, it's hard to use fear tactics when... Yeah and I you know I worked on a city council campaign in the same ward two years ago and that's what I saw. It was interesting at debates they would ask the candidates uh, who would you rank second? Um, it really did bring a civility to the to the campaigning that you don't see with this sort of winner take all. Um, so it, it, you know it does work. It, we saw in another race um, where we had no green, uh, they're they're Democrats. We did see a little bit of negativity, but um, there was a lot of backlash to it. A lot more than you'd see if we hadn't had ranked choice voting. I think so. They really the both candidates had to apologize to each other um, and sort of come out publicly against the negativity. So. I think it really does work. And I'll, I'll just say an interesting observation as somebody who follows polls. I've noticed this year in the national polling for president, uh, most of the polls ask, who is your second choice? Now, of course, this is within primaries, but uh, uh, I think maybe inadvertently or insidiously, <laughs> they are planting in the mind that, that that having and being able to make a second choice is a good thing. Uh, I'm hoping that as people get used to, people who, who are polled or participate in these polls uh, or read them will get the picture that, gee, having a second choice is a good idea. And nobody needed a technical explanation as to, as to why they were being asked to have a second choice. So. Uh, <clears throat> 
it's really as 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 Fairvote would would say, it's easy as one, two, three. I mean, you just simply make a second choice. Uh, you don't, as a voter, you don't have to worry about the math ma mathematics behind the transfer. Uh, so uh, that's optimistic. Uh, uh, I am interested to see what the outcome is in that, and whether the uh, the forces of evil scare the public away from it, because. Uh, uh, yeah, and it, it, it's interesting here in the state. Um, you've sort of seen uh, fair vote. You know, it's it's Greens, it's Democrats, it's it's people across party lines. And um, it is interesting, though, the response from the Democratic establishment. There's sort of a tolerance for it. They they embrace it once it's there. Um, like in St. Paul and Minneapolis, they were very much against it, and now that it's in place, they're very much for it, and they it's in their party platform. But it's also up to the discretion of locals to decide whether they accept that or not. So what we've seen in Duluth is there was um, there wasn't a rejection by the the Democratic Party, but there was a shying away from making a definitive answer on it. And I think they've sort of behind the scenes tried to erode it by rather than uh, fair vote pushing for statewide ranked choice voting, they've pushed this idea of local options. So we wouldn't have ranked choice voting yet in, uh, in statewide elections but we would allow cities to decide whether they wanted it or not. And I think that, that sort of weakens it. I think that the state should just say all cities in the state should have ranked choice voting. But they really have to dance around the issue because the establishment clearly doesn't want it. Yeah, at least uh, getting it on the local level, especially in, 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 in your larger cities, uh, it might seed the thought, you know, as other towns say, well, why can't we do that? You know, when they see how effective it is, how well it works, or or at the very least, uh, how how it isn't really disruptive, uh, uh, and that people can handle it. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised, although it's the long way around, uh, that uh, you might be able to gain momentum, pick up a few more uh, cities and towns, and, and then. Uh, uh, well, the ideal would be to get a couple of state legislators to support it, uh, especially if they're representing districts that cover the cities that do it, and and uh, uh, possibly take that risk because uh, uh, the less secure legis legislators uh, uh, might feel they risk losing. Uh, do you, do you think it would affect the outcome of any of the local elections you've seen? I mean, do you think? Um, this year, I'm not I'm not certain because the only election that it will be in place is for St. Paul, and unfortunately in that ward, like I said, the other Democrats um, who were not endorsed dropped out of the race, so it's only two candidates. Um, we did see Jim Ivey uh, back in 2011. Um, he he was in third and through ranked choice voting through his second place votes um, he actually advanced so or he might have been in fourth and third I can't remember but it did it did influence that election um, his second place votes bumped him up um, in the results so we have seen it influence it um, it hasn't taken us over the top yet but it's fairly new so um, I definitely have hope that you know we'll continue to make gains so Starlene uh, do you have any questions to add um, no, I was just um, trying to reach a few people that said they would be on soon, but I'm not getting a hold of them. <laughs> so I'm glad that you guys got enough lot to talk about. <clears throat> um, why don't we wrap it up with Brandon and um, maybe go back to Hillary while I try and get a couple more people on, more candidates on tonight. Um, but thank you so much, Brandon. Appreciate you being on. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, Thanks for having me. At, yeah, at good luck tonight. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Brandon. Uh, let us know how things turns out. Will do. We'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks. Don't forget to hang up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully, we've got about three or four candidates I've invited, but they're not connecting so, so hmm. Hillary you may be it for a while 
<laughs> well, tell us because I, I really yeah. think there's a need to for for uh, rank and file greens to understand what the does because because you did uh, go over uh, the past history of the the lack of uh, coordinated campaigns. Uh, oh, do do you? There's not much coordination going on. That's that's exactly right. Tell, yeah. Tell me what do you what what do you how do you feel? Uh, uh, the Greens should, should execute their objectives. Do you think they should focus on uh, uh, certain state legislative seats, or do you think a, a single congressional seat, or or you're still examining the possibilities? Right. Um, I think it really depends on the state. So I don't know um, if you were there, Craig, um, but in 2011, I think, Bill Huckleberry came to our national meeting in Alfred and gave a presentation that for me was very eye-opening. And basically, he crunched the numbers and looked at, you know, that was right after I think Elizabeth May had gotten elected in Canada. And there was also another high-profile um, MP elected in the UK, whose name I can't remember at the moment. Um, and there was this sense of like, wow, in Canada, they put all their eggs in one basket. They looked at, you know, they they ran someone, you know, she moved to that district. If they like figured out it was like the greenest riding, which is the term in Canada for a congressional, basically a congressional district. You know, they figured out the greenest place in the country, and they moved her there, and she spent a year building networks and she ran and won. Like, oh, we should do that here. And when you look at the numbers, it's a really different situation. Um, so first of all, <clears throat> the number of people that a riding represents in Canada is more akin to a state rep seat in the United States. I mean, an, a congressperson represents, I think, around 600 some thousand. Um, and by extension, not just the number of people represented and therefore the size of the district and the amount of doors you need to knock on, was the money involved. I mean, the U.S. is just so out of whack with pretty much every other civilized country in the fact that we spend billions of dollars on elections. Our election cycle is essentially never ending, right? You know, Hillary Clinton's been running for president for like a year and a half already, and we still have another year to go. So, you know... What we realize is that, you know, for us to do that for a congressional seat is we're just not there yet. You know, we could do that if it was a state rep seat. But then are we really going to ask people from 50 states across the country to work on getting one person elected to the state house, you know, in Maine or South Carolina or whatever? So so that is a strategy that I think for right now we are not looking at because of just the logistics involved. Um, you know, at some level, we're encouraging anyone and everyone. Well, you know, period in Pennsylvania. Person who eventually wins wins as a write-in, and it's them and three of their friends writing them in. Um, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there that, if we were serious and really focused we could pick off a ton of seats um, and really build some name recognition and credibility. And, you know, even though these seats are sort of small and maybe aren't going to change the world, you know, they're still very important. You know, I know an auditor in uh, Pennsylvania who's a green, we have a few, and, you know, he's been able to do audits in his town where they've looked at, you know, the economics of putting solar panels on the roof of the town hall. Or, you know, they've, they've done a lot of economic impact studies that are essentially grounded in um, environmental practices. And so there's ways to get our values across these small, seemingly inconsequential kinds of things. So I don't know if that's what you were looking for. Yeah, it sets up developing the kind of infrastructure and network uh, right. in those communities because you'll have... Right. An experienced elected official. One thing I've noticed, in, uh, uh, just over to, over the number of years, I've I've been involved with the Green Party uh, for I guess it's well over twenty years now. Uh, that uh, one thing that I hadn't seen 
is that a lot of our local elected officials uh, haven't stepped up to move to move into, uh, and I don't mean higher offices. I'm not saying a, a town council person moves to, to Congress, but uh, there are some counties that have county legislative seats, which are still fairly small. Uh, and, and state legislative, because you mentioned that, it's interesting because uh, in Canada, an MP seat is, is, is no bigger than some of our state legislative seats. So we keep it, you know, how, how all these MPs are elected. Uh, somebody pointed out recently that, that like, uh, most of the countries in Europe are equal to about one or two states in the United States. Yeah, no, that's totally true. And, that, and that's Canada, too. So we get this perspective about... We, we think we're so far behind, uh, and if we start focusing on these local races, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we we then in Europe. Green Party, so, you know, there's candidates with a Uh, Kenneth Collins, and he's running for state assembly in New Jersey, and also Jeff Staples, who's running for the Virginia House of Delegates. So, welcome, guys. Um, make sure your mics, you'll have to unmute them up on top there on the Google Hangout so we can hear you. There Good we go. Good evening. Yeah, Kenneth, hi. How you doing? Jeff, did you figure out where that is? If you put your cursor, run it across the top, you'll see where there's a place to unmute your microphone. Oh. He took off his camera. <laughs> well, anyway, he'll figure that out. So, Kenneth, how's it going? Um, are Have your polls closed yet? Uh, no, the polls haven't closed yet, and none of the results so I won't know. Voters and not surprising. <laughs> Let's see, Jeff, did you get your microphone? figured out? I think so. Can you hear me? Yeah, but you turned your camera off. Can you turn your camera back uh -huh. on for us? The same place okay. right up next to the microphone button. Okay. Well, it doesn't seem to be clicking there. You see the little video icon? Just click it so the red line isn't there anymore. Not working? No, not working. Um, oh, well. Maybe. You see your picture with the water behind you. <laughs> oh, there oh, okay. you go. Okay. There you that, are. That, that, it's turned around now. Um, two cameras on this phone. Yeah, we uh, we our race has concluded here, and unfortunately, I did not win. However, I'm really proud of the results. We got over 30 percent of the vote tonight, and my opponent outraised me over a hundred to one when it comes to money. Uh, he raised 307,000 a little. We'll uh, be back in two years and try again. Um, I think, you know, with the results we got tonight, we'll be able to. And a lot of uh, what I was doing today was I was in working in. What we were all about. Are, are you, is your state party planning on running a lot of candidates next year, too? We have, like, yeah, local elections gonna, uh, next year? 
Yeah, we do. And um, that could be where we get the turnout that we need in order to turn some of these districts green. So, yeah, we are going to recruit some candidates and see what we can do with that. I expect uh, some good favorable results. Great. Kenneth? Yes. Ha, how about uh, you all, uh, are, are you guys going to be running more candidates next year? Um, yeah, well, I'm planning to run for Congress against Scott Garrett myself. Um, and uh, I'm pretty confident that I can give a, a good run for that seat. I, you know, I have the endorsement of the New Jersey Sierra Club this time around. Um, and uh, I've really gotten a lot of support all across the district from all different uh, facets of the community, um, from uh, all different kinds of different community groups throughout the area. And uh, I think Scott Garrett is uh, he, even his own party knows he needs to go. So it's going to be an interesting race. How do you feel about the Green Party? growth in New Jersey in general. I've actually been to uh, New Jersey State Green Party meetings because they're, they're actually closer to me uh, where they've been held uh, than the New York meetings. So I've gone to a few of them. Uh, how do you feel about the growth or do you think there are pockets of growth in the state uh, more like you? Well, you know, I, I do think there are pockets of growth throughout the state and we're trying to organize them in more of a regional way throughout the state than uh, as opposed to specific county green parties. Um, especially up where I am, there doesn't seem to be, be a whole lot of green party involvement. Um, you know, it's very rural, so people are spread out over a pretty wide area, and it's really hard to organize a, a group. So we're, we've been doing a Northwest uh, New Jersey meetup in Parsippany. Uh, and that's been working out pretty well with uh, Jimmy Brash, and, and uh, he's been the, the main person organizing it. But what we've also been doing is uh, using teleconferencing, too, so that people who can't actually make it can be there via teleconference. And that's worked out pretty well. Yeah, I'm, I must say, given the bias and, and the technology we're using tonight, uh, I've and I've live streamed a, a few of the, the Green Party of New Jersey state meetings that oftentimes uh, using some kind of method, teleconferencing or, or live streaming if you're speaking to a broader audience, that uh, it's a lot easier to, to, to hook people in because one of the problems I've, I've seen in the Green Party in the few decades I've been involved is that uh, not everyone can make meetings, and if you don't actually, if for any reason you can't attend meetings for a time, it, it's hard to be connected. Uh, so uh, I think it's important, an important organizational tool uh, to when you have, have meetings to do things like teleconferencing so that uh, people who can't travel uh, can still hold meetings to get, to get work done. Uh, in terms of your own campaign, how how, uh, how did you develop your your, your volunteer base? Did, have you been active locally, or is this you were able to pull things together? Yeah, I've been very active locally, and uh, you know a lot of people from a, from the different um, things that I've been working on. You know, they they really came forward and showed their support and. Uh, as far as the staff goes, I really didn't have a staff. Uh, I, I ran the whole campaign myself uh, with the help of, you know, a couple of friends on a particular task. Um, but primarily, it was all done by me and all for under two thousand dollars. And uh, and I ran a really strong campaign. Uh, the the Republican incumbent and and his running mate felt it was. Uh, absolutely necessary to give it a full court press at the end of this thing and, and get all kinds of radio advertising and uh, things like that. So, you know, they, they're they're running scared. And uh, I think I've got a good chance. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's, that's uh, good steps toward New York in 19... By 93 years... ...thousands of volunteers... Uh, Green Party in there, and although I had some people who had interest, 
meeting that we are going to now. Events and party. And it's also, uh, I, I had been uh, uh, very active in the community, just on, on a bunch of local issues. And uh, when it came time to running, uh, in fact, or not, wasn't so much an issue. It was people knew me and were willing to commit the time to help. Uh, so green becomes a much easier sell when, when you're already connected to the community uh, instead of asking, you know, of course there'll be th those who, who are fellow activists, uh, if you do get involved in community issues, you know, as others do, who will say, well, why aren't you running as a Democrat or in the Democratic primary or something to that effect? Uh, and... Uh, that becomes, uh, 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 I don't want to say, it, it doesn't become an issue so much as an explanation as to why it's important uh, in a general election. My, my explanation is, is uh, if you're in a, in, in a situation where there are two parties that are sort of competing, uh, the percentage you need to win Could win with just more time to not having to fight through a primary and expend resources uh, and then have to do it again, uh, especially if you're if you're uh, presenting yourself as an alternative and, and you're not part of the establishment. Uh, it's easy once you explain that I find it's easier to bring people along and by the time I had run a few campaigns I was able to also get the endorsement of uh, the state Sierra Club uh, of, of a labor union and and actually created splinters within some of the democratic clubs because uh, uh, and it wasn't you know I didn't just appear out of nowhere it's because I had been doing laying the groundwork to get to that point uh, so, uh, Craig? Yes. With Kenneth and go back to Jeff a little bit, and then we've got the, some more folks from New Jersey, I think. Yeah, that looks like somebody I know um, are also <laughs> on. I guess a Jersey. different location. <laughs> um, so thank you for being on tonight, Kenneth, and um, good luck. Yep. Jeff, he's gone. We have w w uh, a, a fellow New Jerseyan who looks like he might be ready to talk. Yeah, that's Steve. Is that yes. you, Steve Welzer? Yes, I, I know Steve. Unmute well. your microphone, you guys. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> With um, in the fourteenth. Uh, I'm I'm doing well. <laughs> Getting to hear a, a perspective of uh, from different parts of the country, uh, which is interesting on local races, because uh, I think. Uh, 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 Local races, as, as, as Hillary mentioned, I think is integ integral to, to planting the seeds to, uh, uh, with the candidates you have with you and what, what their races have been like, their experiences. All right, well, I'll talk for a minute, then I want to let the others uh, talk. Um, <clears throat> we really uh, finally got a slate together in Jersey, you know, parties of uh, kind of ebb and flow uh, in, in interest. Uh, back and we went through some strong races. Um, we also had we had eight for uh, state assembly, and then we had one for what's called in New Jersey um, county freeholder, which in, in all other uh, other states is called um, county supervisor. But we call it freeholder. So we had nine running all together. Um, Joanne and I in, in our district, of course, we're waiting to see the results. But Molly, um, Molly in the 17th, <coughs> that's um, where uh, New Brunswick is and Rutgers University. 
we had Jill Stein come in in the spring and uh, for our state convention and then we had a fundraising dinner afterwards and Molly works for the local um, New Brunswick, was it New Brunswick Today mm -hmm. newspaper. Yeah. Uh, her guy is here who's the editor of the uh, newspaper. And he sent her on assignment to to uh, Charlie uh, to interview Jill Stein. Well, well, uh, Molly at that time didn't know that much about the Green Party, but in talking with Jill, they had a great rapport, and Molly was so like inspired that by the end of the night, she said, "All right, okay, I'm going to not only <coughs> join with you guys in the Green Party, but I, I'm going to commit to run for office." And she followed through on that. See, she did run for office. And so let me introduce Molly O'Brien running in the 17th district in, in New Jersey. Hello. Woohoo! Yeah. Hi. It's a good party to be in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bill Stein actually told me to run for state rep. And then she introduced me to the people who came to see her as their next state representative. So I was kind of put on the spot. Uh, right then and there, and yeah, it's an experience, and uh, it's very related to anger. So that that surprised me, just meeting a lot of people kind of like, well, what are you actually going to do for me, the voter, the citizen, you know? Um, I kind of found that I had to not be on the defense a lot, but I really, I don't know, had to sell myself to a lot of people. Yeah. Very humbling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did uh, did people have a have a uh, a bias one way or the other because you had uh, I guess you were involved in you know as a journalist or somebody written or has had things appear? Well, I felt that saying that I was a journalist or, or saying that I'm a paralegal, you know, um, really helps my case. Um, because I consider myself to be more of an activist than a politician, and, and that's kind of what the Green Party is all about, which, you know, is another thing I learned in my campaign, and I really like. Yeah. Did, uh, uh, did you find, what, what did you, how did you find the awareness, preconceived awareness of the Green Party? Did people say, well, what's that, or I've heard of it, and maybe they had correct or incorrect ideas that you had to ha, had to talk about or, or were they yeah. more focused on I, what you would do as a you know elected official I would say so a lot of people thought that green was more of just like an adjective in terms of just being for the environment or being for like you know the legalization of marijuana <laughs> which is <laughs> that too yeah <laughs> Which are things that we are for, but it's really a whole, you know, as Steve said at our monthly meeting the other day, it's a real, you know, ideology, a set of ideas that we share. And, um, yeah, you know, it didn't take that long to convince people, you know, that we have really strong ideals. And a lot of people took to the message, a lot of young people especially. Did you did you find anybody? Uh, did you find people who were asking you well, why aren't you running as a Democrat or you know? Yeah, my coworker said that yesterday actually. <laughs> um, yeah. How do you and, respond to something like that? Well, it's funny because I was running as a Democrat when I met Jill Stein for Democrat committee, um, and she was pretty much like, "Don't do it. You know, reform doesn't come from within. You have to work." outside the system for a real change and that's pretty much what I told people you know uh, so I told my co-worker yesterday who is an independent we just like to start that yeah that's good I find that uh, uh, a challenging question because uh, you know I, I've also I was a former Democrat very active and and had attempted to run for Democratic State Committee in New York uh, and my feeling after doing that is is I became absolutely convinced it has to happen by building a third party uh, uh, and, and then I felt you know my job as a candidate was in to go out and convince people <laughs> that uh, right right so uh, and it's hard now with Bernie Sanders 
the Bernie Sanders conundrum. Sorry, is that like he who shall not be named? <laughs> he that shall not be. No, is that the? Can, yeah, that dare I call him the false prophet? <laughs> <laughs> sure, that works. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, because he's raised so much money, and and he's, um, you know, he's raised so much money, and he's raised a lot of awareness. I think, at least on social media. Um, and, and he's generated a lot of uh, excitement and energy that yeah. uh, we we suspect when uh, when the Democrats make sure that he doesn't get the nomination. That a lot of disappointed uh, Bernie supporters. We really think there's going to be a flood into uh, into our national campaign in three, six, eight months, whatever. Uh, we're, we're getting ready for the flood to come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Steve and I have been talking to a lot of Bernie supporters in our respective districts. Yeah, we do go to uh, Bernie events. I know I do, um, and uh, and talk with people, you know, in a very sympathetic kind of way, uh, laying the groundwork for them to have some place to turn uh, next year. I also want to introduce Joanne Cousin, who was my running mate. Now in Jersey, the way it works is uh, for state assembly unusual in the odd number of years we have our state assembly races see? and um, there are 40 districts and in each district uh, there are two early and, and by the way our state is unusual in the odd number of years we have our state assembly races see? and um, there are 40 districts and in each district uh, there are two uh, representatives so it's it's really good when the greens are able to run two um, in the district, uh, it's it's just we have our own column on the ballot that way, and uh, I think it's easier for the voters to uh, to find us on the ballot that way. Joanne um, was a person when I was running for governor uh, of New Jersey uh, Green Party two years ago. I was out petitioning, and in front of the post office, uh, I I encountered a very enthusiastic um, signer of the petition, and and she said, "Oh, I." I had been working with the Green Party in California, and just and before I moved to Jersey, so uh, she was glad to find the Greens in uh, Jersey, and we were glad to find Joanne's from from my town, and uh, this year she agreed to run on the ticket. So, ran a great race. So tell me a little bit about your race. Well, I was. I mean, Steve asked me to run it first. I thought, oh, okay, well, I'll do this. But then I got very enthusiastic when I found out how much they make and you get your own staff and your own <laughs> she, office. She's determined to get elected. I was, I was saying, I'm getting elected. So um, I actually had a fundraiser at my house, and I made Steve. We got signs, and on Sunday I went out with uh, Green Party member Bob Shapiro. We handed out 250 flyers because we have limited funds. Um, but for me, it was definitely a, a different experience because of all the questionnaires we had to fill out. Yes. And I actually had some of my neighbors and friends said they looked me up and they were asking me about my <laughs> issues. Yeah. Ah. Um, but um, definitely was a learning experience. Um, we did. Um, we had our signs stolen. That's a good <laughs> sign when they get that upset. It's actually well, a good it, sign. Well, <laughs> my friend said if they're stealing your signs, that means. So I wrote our incumbent, um, the Democrat guy, and sent him a little letter, and he sent me a nasty letter back. <laughs> That's a good sign when they get that upset. It's actually well, a good sign. It, well, <laughs> my friend said, if they're stealing your signs, that means they're feeling threatened. So I yes. guess that's the thing, <laughs> um, that they don't want an independent party to, you know. But it, I have to say I've talked to a lot, because I was very active green in California. And I talked to a lot of people out here, and and as Molly said, everybody's kind of disgusted with the Democrats and the Republicans. And I always said, well, we're kind of in the middle. I said, if you look at our, you know, what we believe in and what we stand for, we're in the middle, and we're not corrupt. We don't take, you know, donations from special interest groups or corporations. And a lot of people really liked that. Um, I said, you know, I'm an ordinary middle class single mom. You know, I've been there, done that. So I was. That was kind of my campaign slogan that I can really relate to. The, you know, the middle class common person. Right. And a good thing uh, in our case is uh, all four 
of the establishment party candidates are, are men. See, both Republicans and uh, both Democrats are uh, men. And so Joanne happens to be among the six running, the only woman running. So there, there's an appeal there that uh, we think will get extra votes based on that. Team. So we're, we're looking forward to some good results in, in Jersey tonight. Maybe we, we probably won't be the majority in the state legislature tomorrow, but uh, <laughs> we're working on it. We're trying. I will say this: I was um, I was canvassing at uh, the Aldi supermarket in one of those towns, and uh, a woman said she had already voted for me because I was the only woman. Oh, you are too. Yeah, she oh. said yeah, that. So that's oh, what that's I'm hoping. Yeah, she did that's say that. She said uh, we have to get in there. Yeah. Yeah. So I I was hoping that. <laughs> But this is my first time ever running, so not many people are familiar with me. I, I mean, I have a lot of friends and neighbors and everything, so I know all my neighbors and friends said they voted for me. So I know at least got 100 votes. And I have 100 cousins, and, and most of them voted. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, thing, one thing that we need to think about, especially in Jersey and in off your races, um, there are a certain number of uh, assembly races where there is no uh, other uh, major party uh, competition. So I think that uh, in two years, one thing we want to uh, think about is like if there are, are 20 or 25 races uh, where the Republicans are the incumbents and there's no Democrats in the race, we, we need to run Green Party candidates in those races mm -hmm. because they'll be seen as the opposition. They'll get pressed. They'll really get more votes than in other cases. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on the, tonight, and good luck. Thanks so much. It's definitely thank a good experience. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. When will you have some results? Uh, when, well, when will you know all the results? Yeah. We'll know tomorrow. And Joanne, if Joanne is elected, the, the press is going to have to track her down. She's taking an early flight to see her daughter in California. So the press is going to have to, <laughs> have to find, follow her, me there. find her in California for her... Uh, for her victory. <laughs> the upset incumbent. I upset the incumbent. <laughs> Thanks oh a lot. Yeah, Hillary, okay. Hillary, are you there, Hillary? Oh, she's not there right now. Okay, I just want to she's say. She's probably that. muted. Her, she's on, but she's muted. But I'm we're going to go to uh, yeah. hear about that. Syracuse, New York right now. But, so thanks, guys. Appreciate yeah. it. And uh, yeah. hopefully you'll run again. Thank you for running. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. right. Again. Keep running. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Frank, are you there? I think your microphone is muted. Turn, turn, uh, unmute the mic up at the top of the hangout there. You well, guys I, can stay on if you want in New Jersey, but we're going to mute you. Can you hear me? <laughs> mute us, please. <laughs> please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Frank, uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. As as someone who who's been following your campaign as a fellow New Yorker at the other end of the state, uh, uh, what? This is your first time running, is that correct? It is. Yes. Yes. Uh, how how did it feel starting a campaign? I know you had a. Had, have a, f a fairly experienced campaign manager, so you weren't you weren't cold starting cold w without some previous history. Uh, uh, how how did it feel being the candidate this time, and and, and having somebody uh, to guide you through some of the more challenging aspects of, of strategy? It was great. <laughs> um, it was wonderful to have somebody who was uh, able to, you know, work that end of a campaign so that I could concentrate on being the candidate. Um, because there's no way that I could have done both of those jobs on my own. And we had a really good division of labor. Not only did I have Ursula working as my campaign manager, but I also had my friend Simone who worked pretty much full time as our volunteer coordinator as well. So it was a pretty well uh, oiled attack. <laughs> so as a candidate then, what, what challenges did you face given you had experience 
management. Uh, so you weren't faced with certain obstacles that other new candidates are faced with. But uh, how did you how did you deal with with the public? I'm sure, like you know, most public areas, uh, there's some which may be very friendly towards the Green Party, and others which which see you as a divisive force. Uh, how did you handle uh, or quell any of the potential hostility? Well. I don't think that I'd say that we got any hostilities. Um, what I would say is that although I was very clearly 100% transparent, running on a Green Party line as a Green Party candidate, that many people did not look at me first as a Green Party candidate. They looked at me first as the community activist, the grassroots organizer that they know. And so any hostilities that may have been potentially there, I think we're really sort of diffused some by the fact that, you know, no, nobody could really attack me in regards to things because I have such a, um, you know, I, I have a record of, of getting things done in the community. And so I think that, you know, that was a strong um, positive aspect of, of me running uh, with, you know, with those pre-existing connections. So what, what were your community uh, community involved issues that you tied into the campaign since, since as a community activist you have a track record so you're not just espousing a philosophy you're saying this is what I've done this is where I think I can go with it uh, yeah. uh, I think a, a couple different ways um, first of all uh, for about five years now I've been um, board president of our local um, community development credit union. And so that, along with my day job as a business advisor for, for New York State, really allowed me to express to people my um, competency in community finance. And so we use that to focus on issues of local job creation, um, the idea of creating a, a fund for a, a revolving loan for developing local co-ops you know, as something that we would pursue um, later on in time. And then when it comes to things like quality of life, and, and this is interesting because my, my, my incumbent opponent uh, really stressed a lot how strongly he was running on his record of constituent services. And I very strongly, and, and his issues, you know, dealing with people's quality of life issues. And I was very vehement about the fact that constituent services is like the lowest bar for a city councilor. Like every counselor should be handling constituent services as a very important role of their job, but we also should be handling issues related to creating policy and legislation and looking beyond, you know, pothole politics for, for two years of another term and looking at systemic solutions as we move forward. And so in regards to quality of life issues, I talked about some of the neighborhood programs that I initiated. Um, I helped to create the Adopt the Trash Can program. Um, that we have in our neighborhood. I have formed and developed you know, five community gardening spaces in the city. Um, those are the kind of things then that I say, you know, I've accomplished this, this at the grassroots and neighborhood level, and now I'm running for office. One of the reasons I'm running for office is I want to take this success and transpose it to the city-wide level. Uh, so did, did you have any opportunity to debate or uh, your opponent in this race? Was there, give, given your experience, uh, how did that work out? What, how did that play out? Yeah, unfortunately the opportunities were few, but there were a couple. Um, we had one uh, uh, community uh, candidate forum where everybody got sort of two minutes to introduce themselves and then got to answer another two questions and had two minutes. So. That was very brief, uh, but I, I, I do believe that every opportunity that I got, that I was able to be very uh, specific with uh, policies and programs that I, that I was promoting and, and not just speak in generalities or platitudes. And the people responded afterwards. You know, they come up to me and said, you know, those are great answers and you, either you have my vote or you would have my vote if I was in your, uh, in your district. Um, and, and one particular... Um, candidate forum that we had, my opponent 
uh, came in very late uh, and sat at the back of the room. And then when it was his turn to speak, it actually took about 15 seconds of people yelling across the room at him and because he had uh, supposedly dozed off. And then when he came up to speak, and you know you were given uh, two minutes to speak, he used about 15 seconds. Basically said, you know, I'm here. I've done the job. You know, I will, I will look out for you. You know, and, and continue to perform constituent services, and, and you should elect me. So, very simple, very lackadaisical, very lacking in any sort of substance, and that's sort of the record of of you know the, the opportunities that we had with uh, against each other. How did, how did the media respond to, to that? Especially since I'm sure they saw the the performance and, and the clear differences between somebody who was just talking constituent services and somebody who actually has a plan, a legislative plan. Uh, how did the media respond? I don't think the, re the media really responded at all, unfortunately. They, they just didn't get it. You know, uh, At one point a couple weeks ago, we got word that our major newspaper, the Post Standard, was not even going to cover our district race. Um, they had set aside some sort of vague reasons, you know, of who they were going to cover and who they weren't going to cover, and they decided they weren't going to cover our race. So right off the bat, you see that it wasn't important to them to even be thinking about these these issues and policies um, that I had been articulating for many months. Um, we eventually uh, successfully lobbied the paper, and, and they came down, and then they did a question and answer session with me and my opponents. Um, but, it, but it took them a while to do that. Uh, the people that I have talked about, so uh, that I have talked to aside from the media, though up to this point, have responded positively to the differences be between my and my opponent. Uh, given, uh, Craig. Yes. I just wanted to ask Frank about the sure. results so far. I, I heard you were at thirty-seven percent. Let's see. I can actually tell you right now. Uh, yeah. So only one, uh, only one out of twenty-five uh, polling places reporting so far. The incumbent is at forty percent. I'm at thirty-seven percent, and the the re Republican candidate is at uh, twenty-one percent. So we're right there, wow. neck, neck and neck right now. Good job. Can you look up Howie Hawkins for us, too? Yes, yes. Who's running for state auditor, right? City auditor, yes. This time? City auditor. City, oh. city, city he usually, auditor. he's run for city council quite a few times, yeah. I know. Uh, uh, re respectable so far, uh, 63 to 36 mm -hmm. right now. He's at 36? Yes. Uh, All right. Tell me a bit yeah. about... The nuts and bolts of your campaign, since you had a, and and for those watching, Hi, that's Ursula. that's the campaign manager. Who, yes. <laughs> that's Ursula. Hi, you know Ursula. Are you live streaming right now? Yeah, we're live. <laughs> Ursula Rosen. I don't think we mentioned her last name. Uh, we're many of us are familiar <laughs> with Ursula, uh, yeah. who is actually very, uh, very good managerial skills. And for that reason, uh, I want to ask you, uh, since you're probably in a situation where you had the nuts and bolts uh, down. Talk to us a little bit about what those nuts and bolts were. Did, did you have mailings, did you door knocking? How, how did you you get out the vote? Yeah. How did uh, that work? Well, um, so we had uh, we we had a budget of about twelve thousand dollars that we were working with um, that we had planned in our, in our campaign plan, and we did since we, since we started so early in June. We were able to do multiple rounds of outreach and voter contact. So we started in June with our first uh, piece of literature, which was just a uh, half sheet, black and white, um, regular printer stock paper, nothing fancy at all. But we took that and we did a first round of door to door contact. Then uh, a little bit later in the summer, we did a round of uh, door hangers. And these were professionally, you know, full color um, design. Uh, Ursula did the design work and, and the layout on those. So that was our second round of contact. Uh, then we had our third round of contact, September and October, whenever we were actively um, 
taking our, our last piece of literature around and once again knocking out um, every door uh, of registered voters in the district. And throughout the last uh, month, month and a half, we've also been overlaying that last round of door knocking with a round of, of almost nightly or every other night um, phone banking as well, um, reaching out to candidates. So we had a lot of a long period of time to be able to do uh, a lot of voter outreach and voter contact. Um, and you can imagine that since we did so many rounds of contact, that one of the challenges uh, and that, that Ursula faced was keeping the database uh, up to date and keeping the data entry um, timely as well, so that we could then uh, react to the responses that we, that we are getting from, from voter contact. And she did great. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, do you think you you have important lessons to share with other Greens? Because I think a lot of Greens are uh, run, uh, especially first time out, very small campaigns, and, and they, they're sometimes more message driven than, than tactical and strategy. Uh, and it sounds like you have a, a, a fairly good set of tactics and strategy to go along with the message, which is important because that's how you get from being heard to, 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 to developing wins down the road. And it does sound like uh, from the numbers you're getting ever closer, uh, <laughs> ever closer to that. Uh, uh, but what I think is important uh, in the Green Party is that, that people who have such experiences share them to, to with, with other newbies. So do you have a post-campaign strategy towards developing the Greens further uh, uh, around you in Syracuse and maybe around the rest of the state or the country? I mean, right now you're talking to Greens around the country. Yeah. Well, definitely locally. Uh, we have to create more of a, a, a year-round uh, presence and movement. Uh, and one of the problems that we have sometimes with this is that it's not campaign season. Our Green Party members, our Green Party volunteers, will identify with some other organization, you know, like the Sierra Club or you know, our Urban Jobs Task Force. But what we need them to do is to participate in those discussions and those actions, but to do so while they're identifying as Green Party members. So that's that's a big thing. Um, I you know I have some ideas for how we can maybe move forward uh, with, with our presence in the city, and I think it's, I, what I feel personally is that it might be important for us to focus on like one or two main issue campaigns during the off-campaign season um, so that we can be uh, present and significant in, in, in those campaign issues um, as a Green Party movement and not spread ourselves too thin, you know, just trying to have our fingers in everything um, as we move forward. And I think that, um, you know, the other big thing is, is dealing with the data and dealing with the information that, that comes in, both from the campaigning, uh, but also from, you know, just trying to do more outreach uh, during the course of the, of the year as well. And how do we manage that information? Um, you know, we use Nation Builder, uh, the Nation Builder software system right now. Um, I don't know what's going to happen after this election because Nation Builder has changed its, uh, its, its membership structure and its user structure and some of the features that they have. So we're going to have to review that and identify, you know, how we're going to move forward using that 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 uh, format or not, um, as well. So those are some of the questions that we have in mind, as well as, you know, we've never had a whole lot of luck with reaching the student population. We've got Syracuse University, Lemoyne University, um, SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Um, we have two very young school board candidates uh, on the slate this year, and one of our goals is that these young school board candidates and hopefully help us reach the student population um, as well. And I think that will be a goal for us as, as well moving forward. Uh, thank, thank you, Frank, for, for being here. Uh, you, you've uh, given us a, a very good, not only an overview as a candidate, but uh, 
some of the technical strategy and tactics involved, given uh, the experienced people you've had working with your, with yourself. Uh, so uh, I appreciate your being involved in that part of an effort and, and uh, elevated the, the, the level of candidacy to the extent you have it, and I'm sure will continue as, as you reach other people. Uh, so uh, thank, you. thank you very much, and, and we'll be paying attention to the final numbers as they come in. Uh, regardless of what happens, it sounds like the numbers will certainly be reasonable and respectable. Uh, so many Greens are, are run 1% campaigns, and, and, and you and some of your fellow Syracuse Greens are, are, are running very, very competitive campaigns. You're really, at the very least, establishing yourselves a, a, as a significant number two party in Syracuse. Uh, so, well, that's, all right. th that's th awesome. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the the time uh, tonight, and uh, look forward to you know talking and sharing more in the future. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Frank. You're welcome. Good luck. Thank you. Um. We're going to go to Kristen Combs in uh, in Pennsylvania. Kristen, are you there? It, uh, oh, you need to unmute your microphone, uh, which would be up at the top of the Google hang Hangout window. There's a place. Um, okay, there we go. Yep, there you go. Hi. Hi there. And, uh, Thanks for joining us tonight. So you're running for city council, is that right, in uh, Philadelphia? Yeah, I'm running for city council at large. So there are district seats and then there are at large seats, and I'm running for the at large position. Oh, okay. How's it going? Do you have any results back? Yeah, it's looking like um, things are going to stay status quo. So the interesting thing about this race is that there are seven seats available. In the home rule charters, five of those seats can go to one political party. Um, Philadelphia is majority a democratic city, and the five Democrats froze, breezed through into the final round. They won their seats easily as we expected them to. Um, what we were hoping is that we could knock out one of the Republicans from the two minority seats. It looks like the Republicans, two of them, are going to hold their final seats. Um, but we did make a strong standing, definitely made some waves. And the other independent that was in the race that had a lot of traction, um, we're kind of going neck and neck with him right now. And um, people expected us to be significantly behind him. So that's that's really encouraging. Um, we are going neck and neck with a candidate that outraised us financially um, like 10 to 1. Yep. That often happens with Greens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we get we spend a lot less money and get a lot more done. Get a lot more votes. Given given the size of Philadelphia, uh, what was it like running a, a citywide campaign if it was an at-large seat? Uh, there must have been significant challenges in outreach. Did, what was your strategy to, to reach as many voters as possible? Yeah, I started really early. I mean, I started this back in last November, so I've been working on the campaign for about a year. And we started out um, approaching issues groups. Um, so I've been involved in a lot of movement work in Philadelphia. Um, I'm involved with the fight to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. I've been involved with the police brutality fight. I'm also a public school teacher, and so have a lot of connections through the social justice movement for unionism um, in public school education field. Um, and so those are really the groups that I approached first and started getting those groups on board, and then we could move from there. Sorry about the background noise. There's no real quiet place here. We're at the post-election celebration. Um, this is Hillary. I wanted to chime in with a comment um, because I'm also from Philly, and so I have a lot of to our uh, and I'm to ran a citywide candidate was Sherry Coppola in 2011 when she ran for sheriff. 
and Kristen is on pace to meet and or exceed the number of votes that Sherry got in that race. So in 2011, Sherry pulled in of like 10,300 votes. And it looks like Kristen, um, with not all the precincts in, is um, trending in that same uh, direction. Um, and that also was a campaign that raised more money than and um, had some more legs with Sherry's name recognition than Kristen started with. So that's also a testament to the race that Kristen has run and the, the level of organization. Um, so I just wanted to chime in with that. Thanks, Hillary. So with that background, did you, did you find it, uh, s since there's a track record in Philadelphia, did you find uh, people were familiar with the Green Party? Uh, or did that race give them any predispositions you were up against or helped by? Uh, I mean, were people saying, oh, Sherry Honkel, and now there's you? Uh, or, hey, you're still here. You, you guys are running, you know, another candidate. That's good. Uh, did you find there was any, any kind of particular public reaction to you when you are going out there, positive, negative? Uh, or the Green Party? There was definitely a reaction. A lot of people have heard of the Green Party in Philadelphia. Um, they were excited to see that there was another candidate who was running a serious race. Um, they felt like they hadn't seen that out of the Green Party in a while in Philadelphia and were very excited to see an organized campaign, to see someone that they felt like they could really get behind on the issues and someone that they could feel excited to go vote for at the polls. Um, and that, that was a, pretty much the general reaction we got. Um, and they definitely were excited to hear about a Green Party candidate that they felt like they could stand behind. Uh, that's good. So, so you're getting a sense that, they, that, that there may be some growth out of it since there's now a repeat history and a familiarity, because that's oftentimes one of the big hurdles uh, uh, when Greens first start running in an area. Uh, how did you find when you, when you spoke to the community groups? Uh, did you find any sense of support or lack thereof, or misgivings, or uh, what was their response? Because uh, that's often a hurdle. Uh, when when one announces one's running as a green and not uh, and not affiliated with a major party, even though they may be people you've you've worked with. Yeah, honestly, because of the structure of this race, I was really only up against Republicans. Um, so I had that edge when I got to go talk to community groups. Um, it's really part of why we chose this race to run in. It was a really strategic decision to pick a race. Um, where we wouldn't have to be head-to-head -head against the Democrats, where they couldn't make the argument of a spoiler, um, and the liberals and progressives in the city who typically vote Democrat because they feel like that's the way their voice can be heard, um, could, could step out and could vote for a Green, and that we could use that as a way to build trust in the Green Party in the city. Um, and so when I was speaking to community groups, I really didn't have to deal with those typical hurdles that a Green Party candidate faces because I'm not in that same kind of competition. I'm really only up against Republican and other minority candidates. Well, well that's an important bit of information because uh, how and, and why one picks specific districts to run in uh, uh, is important. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, with, the, with the Democratic machine out of the picture, uh, uh, you're the option, and people who want an option are, are likely to give you undivided attention. Uh, did you... Uh, did, did, did you develop a volunteer base out of those community groups? Did, did any of them actually provide donations or resources, or uh, were they excited to have an alternative to to, to the Republican? Yeah, machine? we had 
We had about 100 volunteers out at the polls today, um, and those primarily came from not your standard green groups. They came from Neighborhood Networks, which is a group that almost always endorses Democratic candidates. Um, they were a lot of teachers who similarly um, almost always vote Democratic, but because there was a public school teacher running who they knew and they trusted, they came out to the polls to work for me. Um, and we really did. We got a lot of support from those same community groups. We had some of the workers from 15 Now. And All your supporters here. <laughs> I'm getting called into the other room, so I'm going to have to run really soon. Is there another question you'd like to ask real fast? Uh, uh, yeah, I had one. Uh, what, what, were, what was the most important issue or the top issues, if you, if you can just run down? Because uh, I think that might help other Greens who are watching in terms of what thing, what people think of or, or, or espouse. Was 15 now uh, your biggest issue or one of your biggest issues? Yeah, my biggest issues were the $15 an hour, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Um, finding a way to fully fund public schools and the plan for that was really specific to Philadelphia but it really came down to finding a way to change the tax base to um, prioritize people instead of prioritizing the corporation so finding tax breaks that work for working people and work for the poor instead of giving abatements to the major corporations within Philadelphia um, and then finally, a civilian overview of the police in Philadelphia. A um, recent report came out saying that Philadelphia has one of the most racist police forces in the country. Um, and so citizens of Philadelphia are really fighting to have their voices heard and to really push for community policing. Um, and so that was another big piece of my platform. And those spoke to people and they turned out. Uh, that's good to hear. Th thank you for being here and, and thank you for telling us about your campaign, Philadelphia being uh, a, a very large city, and, and therefore this would actually be a very, very big race. Uh, uh, so thank you for taking the time and uh, being here, and uh, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much, guys. Take care. Good luck with the rest of tonight. Thank you, Kristen. Bye. Excellent. All right. Um, I could read off some of the election results. Um, the only other guest we have uh, that I'm not sure about is Francisco Herrera in San Francisco, running for mayor. And I've been texting back and forth with his campaign manager, so I'm hoping he's going to be able to come on. Um, and then Joshua Kelly, I've invited, but hasn't joined the Hangout yet. So Josh, if you're out there listening, um, try and um, get into the Hangout with us so we can talk to you. So um, so do tell us some of, the, some of the results you're seeing. Yeah, let me, hold on, let me get to the page. We have a special Facebook page for um, everybody to post their election night results. And uh, Frank gave you some info about Syracuse. Let's see here. Hillary, who's still on the call, I think, said 92% uh, of precincts reporting. Lucille Prater Holiday has 19% of the vote as magisterial district judge in a two-way race against a Democrat, and that's in Pittsburgh. So that's uh, Lucille. Um, Hillary also reported that Jay Sweeney uh, uh, won his re-election as Fall Township Auditor, had 98% of the vote. Go, Jay! <laughs> Good job, Jay. Um, Kristen was just on. She Last we heard, she has about 10,000 votes. Needs about 32,000 to win. Uh, let's see, Becker Smith, who's also a ca coordinated campaign committee member, he said um, with 90% of the precincts reporting, Jeff Staples has pulled 30.3% of the vote in the Virginia House of Delegates, District 81. We were just talking to Jeff earlier. He said, although the incumbent Republican will keep his seat, Jeff has run one hell of a campaign, deserves our heartfelt thanks and congratulations. So 
Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Congrats, Jeff. Thanks, uh, Sid, for giving us that info. And let's see. We also have uh, a win in um, Virginia. Right. Uh, a school board, oh gosh, Apopinatox. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. County school board. Sorry, the people live there. Um, oh, okay. Thank you. Although the race is nonpartisan, she ran unopposed. It should be noted that Wendy is a member of the Central Virginia Greens local, the Green Party of Virginia. So, good job there. Um, I think that's all we have right now. I'm sure within the next couple of days we'll be, we'll be flooded with numbers. Uh, interesting, the, the numbers that I'm hearing are, are much higher than, than I remember just a few years back. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it seems Me like too. it seems like we've we've hit a pattern where, where we have lots of greens running in, in, in healthy double digits. I mean it used to be, We'd hear about state house candidates running one, two, and three percent, and now we're hearing uh, a fair number of competitive races, competitive races at the at, at the city level, uh, and and I do hope uh, we get that word out there post election, uh, even though they might not be wins in the oh, traditional yeah. sense. Uh, these are yeah significant significant party building when we get those kind of numbers in, in, in races across the country. Yeah. Oh, hey, Joshua is here. Now that he's on live, I can see. And he has his video turned on. Joshua, are you there? Hi there, Charlene. How are you? Oh, good. Oh, okay. There's your video. I'm good. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. We're live, too, you're, you're from in. Watford, Connecticut, with, and I'm with uh, Baird Walsh Collins, yep. who's also running for office in town. Oh, Baird, yeah. hey. Hello. Right, Connecticut, Waterford, Connecticut. Cool. So what are you guys voting, uh, running for? Well, I ran for RTM, um, which is the representative town meeting in the second district of Waterford. And I ran for the Zoning Board of Appeals alternate position. Uh, we also had three other candidates in town um, running for the Board of Education, the Board of Selectmen, and uh, another seat on uh, the RTM. Excellent. Great. Well, we're happy you joined us. Absolutely. We're glad to be here. Have you gotten any results back yet? Um, we're starting to see results now. Uh, luckily, I ran on a post, um, so that election is, or that, that uh, um, vote is, is already set in stone. Um, we have not heard back on Baird's race at this point. Um, we're still waiting on those numbers. Um, for the Board of Education race, um, we're starting to see some numbers now. Unfortunately, it looks like our candidate, Kevin Kelly, um, did not win, uh, but he still did gain um, 1,148 votes. So far. Uh, so far, and the numbers are still coming in. So um, it was a good showing, certainly there. Um, for Board of Selectmen, we, we um, got a fair number of votes, and we're still waiting for the accurate results for the other RTM seat as well. Mm -hmm. so, so amongst... Did you all... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so amongst those who are running... Uh, were some of you experienced candidates? Have you run before, managed before, or, or, or were you all new? Uh, what was the makeup of, of uh, since you mentioned a few candidates? Uh, one of the candidates, um, Billy Collins for Board of Selectmen, he ran last year for um, state representative. Um, so he had a little bit of experience with that. Um, I had not personally run before. Um, I don't think any of the other candidates had electoral experience, but a few of them did have experience with management positions and similar sorts of action. Mm -hmm. um, but this was really our first chance to delve into um, a full local election. Um, we did, of course, as we said, try to um, run uh, Billy Collins for um, the state representative seat last year. Um, that campaign wasn't quite as coordinated, um, and I think that it... it was certainly a learning experience that helped us build up for this year. Absolutely. So, uh, 
what was it like having several candidates in in an area running? Did, did you get a sense that there was more more uh, I don't want to say confidence by the public, but a sense that it was not just individuals, but a but a group of people, a party, uh, even if they were nonpartisan races, that a group of people were were running for these positions. That there's no organization there. Absolutely, without any doubt. Um, Last year, Billy Collins got about three percent of the vote for his, um, his seat on this uh, as a state representative, and this year uh, we're already seeing that the minimum that somebody got um, was four percent of the vote, and we're seeing um, much higher uh, turnouts for the other positions. So um, there's definitely a consensus um, on, from the public on the fact that they are more interested um, in the Green Party now. They accept the Green Party a little bit more. Um, and they're glad that the Green Party is forming into be or to become a more solid, um, more well-founded organization in this area. <clears throat> and they do recognize it as more of you know an organized uh, group rather than just individuals that are running uh, due to the number of candidates that we put mm -hmm. forward. We tried to spread the candidates out not only to give them the best chance in each of the races, but to create you know kind of a a whole you know group of candidates in different areas. A true slate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, That's great. That's great. How did you feel the media responded to you? Did, did you get coverage in local papers, or did you have to fight for that? Or, uh... um, I felt that the media responded very well. Um, the local papers seemed to cover us. Um, you know, they gave us as much coverage as the Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, there were a couple errors, but that's to be expected. Uh, one way that we tried to use the media to our advantage is we got, you know, lined up and organized a series of people to write letters to the editor so that every week at least there was a letter in support of the Green candidates in there for at least two months leading up to the election. Mm -hmm. So so that brings up a good point uh, of, of strategy and tactics. So so one of your strategies was was uh, uh, writing letters to the editor, uh, I take it. Did you... What, what was... Uh, Given you, you, your diversity of races, uh, what were the different strategies that you that you that you did in terms of outreach, uh, door knocking, public events, uh, present a picture, uh, and you each may have done something different. Right. <clears throat> well, for my campaign for RTM, um, essentially what we did in addition to the press coverage was I went door to door throughout my district, um, and we. You know, we handed out flyers, we handed out information, made that available to the public. Um, we also were very active on social media through town Facebook groups as well as those of our own. And I say, you know, strategically what we tried to do is for the RTM position specifically, you could vote for five different candidates. So, you know, realistically speaking, we tried to appeal to Democrats to vote for the Democratic candidates as well as the Green candidate. We appealed to the Republicans to vote for the Green candidate as well as the Republicans as well as the Green Party candidate, because they had the option to support their main party as well as us. And we hope, therefore, you know, to kind of build a greater base than we would otherwise find if they could only choose one candidate. But overall, it really was um, kind of a, a two-pronged two situation for us, where uh, on one hand, we were trying to um, appeal to... Uh, the Waterford Greens are primarily uh, a college-based group. Um, so we did try to appeal online a lot to um, different individuals around town, but we did try and make it a very personal campaign, um, going door to door, um, making sure that people not only knew um, what the Green Party was, but knew that we were part of the Green Party, that they could contact us anytime, um, and make sure that, that we had that first initial connection so that we can build from there. And a lot of our candidates have been very involved in the community, you know, in other aspects, you know, within the school system and things of that nature. So they had a group of people that were already willing to support them and to help, you know, put up signs, canvas, do the things necessary to build support and awareness. Have you noticed a lot more support from young people? Yeah, um, I haven't seen a high voter turnout from young people. Um, any more than would be, you know, expected in a municipal election. But in terms of the support we got from those that did turn out, it seemed very strong. Absolutely. And and as I said, um, the large majority of our, um, at least local party as it operates, and our, our volunteers are definitely um, members of, you know, uh, youth. Um, but we, we have certainly more than that in terms of voters who are coming out and supporting us at the ballot. 
Do you... Go ahead, Sterling. You were going... No, uh, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, do you have uh, a, a strategy uh, or, or are you thinking about strategies of getting young people out? Because it seems that you're, you're describing you have, you have in terms of your active base is young, uh, but you, you, you're finding the same uh, uh, challenges that so many of us have, that, that young people don't, especially when they have an alternative, it's hard to get them out the door and say, this is different. This is not the mm -hmm. establishment. Right. You can do something. <clears throat> well, one thing that we have done is uh, we, we know some of the civics teachers in our local high school, and we've sent in Green Party oh. members to talk about the importance of local politics, as well as, you know, we frame it in terms of all of the political parties. So we discussed the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, and the Waterford Independent Party, which is something we have here. So we tell them they have all these options, and we tell them the importance of involvement. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely been one of our strategies. Um, beyond that, um, it's a work in progress. I think that one of the big challenges of our time uh, at the moment is trying to figure out how to um, engage youth in politics and engage youth in um, the Green Party. Um, and I think that we're, we're struggling along to do that um, the same as many other parties are. And we're, we're looking to local parties in Connecticut um, to try and help us out with that. We also try to be visible in public areas, undertaking you know fundraisers for charitable causes, and mainly one thing we do we do trash cleanups, you know, on a at least in the summer a monthly basis around town in public areas, you know, the beach that we have here on various high traffic roads, and that you know makes us visible in the community and involves a lot of young people from the high school who want to get um, community service hours, which is a requirement for graduation, mm -hmm. and that helps get them involved in the political process of working with the Green Party. Cool. Yeah, I've noticed that our, um, ever since we got on Instagram, we've got mm -hmm. all these young people now interested in us. Mm -hmm. It's been really amazing to watch, yeah. And uh, social media is a way to reach them, a lot of people. <clears throat> um, primarily we use Facebook. Um, we find that it's a very um, positive forum in which to disseminate information. Um, you, can, you can spread a lot of information very quickly over Facebook. Um, that being said, a lot of younger people are turning away from Facebook now. A lot of them aren't using it as much and a lot of people um, aren't using it to follow um, political organizations. So we are also on Twitter. Um, we have talked about using um, different different uh, platforms, um, such as Instagram. Um, we have didn't do that this year, but of course uh, we're always trying to expand. So um, that might be our next step. We have been successful on Facebook, though. Um, I will point out that our party page has more likes than both the Democrat and Republican pages for our town. <clears throat> Well, to be honest, uh, yeah, we were both very experienced in Facebook. Um, Baird and I have both kind of grown up in this era of using Facebook. It seemed very natural to us. And um, so we didn't, I'm not even sure we actually questioned it that much. It seemed like if we wanted to promote our party, it was the natural thing to do. Um, that being said, I think what we had to do was kind of decide how else to advertise to people. That didn't necessarily feel natural to us um, with flyers and with brochures and all of that. Um, but yeah. so Facebook was the natural uh, go-to platform, and I think that um, you know from there we've it's been a little bit of an learning experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you find anything else? Yeah. Uh, uh, more, you know, was how did handing out flyers work? Uh, curious, what was the feeling you got? That that went pretty well. Um, you know, it was we'd knock on a door, no one was there. We'd leave a flyer. If someone was there, we'd give them a flyer and ask if they had any questions or wanted to talk about the issues. Usually they didn't, but um, you know they were all, they would always take the flyer and be very uh, you know kind and responsive. 
and I think that was very helpful. I was actually speaking earlier today while out in front of one of the polling stations to a young Republican candidate for the same position I'm running for, and he mentioned that going around Quaker Hill, which is the district I was running in, he kept running into houses where the Greens had already been, and they turned him away because they were already supporting me as the candidate. He was kind of jokingly voicing his frustration, but it shows how effective that, you know, going to people's doors, showing your face, handing them concrete information can be. Because when people have something in their hand, you know, that tells them when the election is, tells them who's running, you know, that gives them guidance in how to move forward. Yep, yep. Direct contact uh -huh. is important. Exactly, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Well, you guys are inspiring. Are you are you sharing at your buds? <laughs> we are, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Collect. Um, and I can also say at this point, um, sorry to interject, uh, but we did just get the updates from Baird's race. Um, unfortunately, it, oh. it was a, a six-way race, and every voter could vote for five people. Um, Baird got 11 percent, or almost 12 percent of the vote. Um, out of those six candidates, so fairly good showing, uh, but unfortunately he didn't clinch the seat. Uh, oh well, next time. Yep, definitely. Yep. And now that names yeah. are out there, uh, this is really the first time that we've had um, a wide variety of candidates running, as we said before. Um, so now that we've become more household names in town, we're looking forward to growing uh, as a grassroots party and making sure that uh, the next time we come out um, people already know who we are, and we can expand on that, and we can really talk more about issues than we can about, um, you know, just have, making sure that people know us. Yeah, you guys are on the right track. I mean, you know, I think I think young people, once young folks find out how much fun it is to be in politics, and, you know, and how much fun it is to, uh, you know, be able to give your opinion in public, and people actually listen to you. <laughs> You yes. know, and the media listens to you. You know, it's just so exciting, and they can really create change. And if they can come into the Green Party and start, you know, either helping a campaign like yours or running, it'll just grow and grow and grow. You know, we outnumber the establishment. <laughs> you know, we just got to work together. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you guys for running, and thank you for being so courageous to to do this. And I hope you'll do it again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, can, can I any other ask questions, you? Chris? Yeah, just as could, regarding doing doing it again. Uh, for for your experienced candidates, do you think you, you're going to attempt uh, a next level up? And for those who are running the first time, do you think uh, many of them will run again? And, and, and the two of you included, uh, um, experience and doing it again. Yeah, I definitely plan on running again. I think that uh, you know what we saw was you know a good start. It was the first time party. It's the first time we've ever had a Green Party in town. It was the first time I've ever run a campaign, and I think that we did pretty well, all things considered. Um, and I think that next time, you know, we try again. If we don't win, then we try again, and we keep going until we do win. Yep. Exactly. And I've already talked to some of the other <coughs> candidates um, who who haven't run a campaign before before now, and. Um, you know, it, it, it wasn't as bad an experience for them as, as they might have thought it would be. It wasn't as much work, um, and now they're willing to put in a little bit more work, and they think that um, they can get that seat. They realize that there is actually an interest, um, and that, that they really can, um, you know, lead this difference. So we definitely are interested in running again, um, and both Baird and I are currently studying um, government and political science, so um, we're definitely in this for the long haul, and we're looking to make it. That that's all right. That's good. It's it's an endurance test for sure. Uh, yes, and, it is. And we we can and do endure. <laughs> yes. Yep. Uh, thank thank you for being here. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. And thank you for organizing there in Waterford yep, and the surrounding areas, Connecticut. Well, I think we're gonna um, wrap things up here, Craig. Um, don't. I haven't okay. heard about Francisco, so. Oh wait, let me try. Hold on, you talk for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's see if I can email them. Well, it definitely looks like a, an encouraging year for for Green Party 
growth. And, and I think we, we answer uh, uh, our critics. Uh, I, I'm acutely sensitive to the critics I hear in social media say, the Greens should focus on local races. A and I kind of think, well, gee, <laughs> I think we do that a lot. And I think uh, tonight's show gave a, a good cross-section uh, of the scores of local candidates uh, who run across the country as Greens. We absolute, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely uh, focus on local candidates. So, so next year when we enter, you know, the presidential race, you know, people talk about, well, you know, w what's the win for, for a Jill Stein campaign? Well, the win is probably the, the hundred some more candidates who are running on slates uh, for local office uh, and, and presenting that slate and, and having a message at the top of the ticket as well uh, because that gets us the ballot lines and and the fundraising and the recognition so that our candidates have have moved a long way from 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 single digits to 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 significant numbers and those starting out now have a ladder to climb so uh, we are certainly about the local candidates uh, and whenever anybody brings up, you know, if they're only hearing Jill Stein the national stage, uh, they may want to look locally. Uh, they may find that there's a lot more to it. Uh, we are a party developing uh, both the depth and breadth. Breadth and breadth. Uh, and we're investigating the uh, possibility of getting... Uh, at least one more candidate on, but uh, I do think. Uh, oh, good, good, great, great. And this, <coughs> right. Right, people are more people are more acutely aware. Yep. 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 And this is, you know, a year like this is referred to the off election year, and and you can see it was very much an on year for us. Uh, in the number of small races <coughs> and I think all these small races uh, plant the seeds uh, uh, in a very fertile soil of a very frustrated America uh, where people are you know f for the public I think voting for these local candidates may be their first you know their first toe in the water uh, Let's see what happens if I support something different. Uh, and uh, through this round, people will find that it's a comfortable thing to do. And and uh, the connections are strong enough and, and, and the numbers are good enough that more people will join them. And uh, given the national climate, uh, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if next year resulted in yet a, another 
uh, bump up for the Green Party uh, uh, once the general election uh, rolls around and people say, you know, I think there'll be a very sense of, oh no, not again, when they look at uh, from top to bottom what the other parties offer. Uh, and uh, with this groundwork, I think there's uh, there's uh, uh, territory for us to grow in. Uh, and each local campaign springs into new local activity. I mean, one of the themes uh, you heard tonight are uh, the can candidate as activist, candidate with uh, uh, <coughs> pre-existing community experience or with the intent of, of taking their campaigns post campaign post campaigns uh, uh, to the public to maintain those bonds uh, you know they so so when, so when the resumes are looked at in the future campaigns oftentimes you know the resumes for the for the major parties have to do with patronage you know which law firm they work work for or which incumbent they were on staff uh, and, and, and I think the public is realizing that that doesn't really work very well uh, what they'll see in green candidates is uh, what issues have, have they been involved in uh, how have they challenged to change the system uh, and, and we're doing a better job of, 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 of connecting activism with electoral politics, which I think is is uh, uh, fairly unique to the Green Party. There are other groups that do that, but in terms of the scale that the Green Party is involved in, uh, you know, on the uh, a national level of you know scores of local races, uh, uh, our our scale is large. And there's a lot. Yep. Yep. The the voters will look at resumes of, you know, issues you've worked on, as opposed to corporate clients and law firms. Uh, you know, have what what your uh, experience so that that will that will uh, broach and break the the mold on in terms of you know experience experience has always been you know what experience do you have in you know holding office uh, and I think the new new question will be well, what experience do you have in delivering as an activist because that's real experience because uh, that's uh, those are the agents of change, and I think the public uh, is stepping closer to, to to taking that agent of change. Uh, the numbers are showing it. Uh, so, uh, Starlene, how uh, uh, how close are we to having our <coughs> Excuse me. Perhaps their LTE connection is better than their internet connection. <coughs> you have to hold the phone right near to the microphone. Uh, yeah, you, one of the challenges we have in doing. Ah, okay. Yeah, the Google. Him. <laughs> S -s 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 
What, what were you talking about? I was I was listening, but uh, in terms of well, this is probably fairly directly related to, to the coordinated campaign committee in terms of, of focusing on local campaigns but uh, and, and, and local growth uh, uh, how do you feel about uh, uh, finding or developing activists to run for office I know that's an odd way of approaching the question but uh, uh, from whence do where, from whence do green candidates come, or from where they come? Um, I think they come from all walks of life. I mean, I've really seen a large variety in my years. Um, I think when we get activists to run, that's ideal. They have connections to the community. They have leadership and credibility prior to running for office. Um, However, I think there's also a challenge with, you know, running for office is not the same as being an activist. It's a different skill set, it's a different mentality and approach, and so some people struggle with that transition and others really do not. Um, you know, we've also seen the random person who just seems to come out of nowhere and suddenly, you know, feels the calling, so to speak, um, to run for office and to run this green. And, um, you know, that's great, too, though those folks don't necessarily have the same power. Um, so it, it really just depends. And obviously, there's the Grow Your Own. We've got lots of folks who have just been active in the Green Party for years and then finally feel like, you know, it's my turn. You know, if we need someone to run for this seat. Why not me? Um, so it really, I think there's, you know, a wide variety of people who run for office. Um, and run a dream. Every once in a while, we get someone like Andrea Merida, who is was a Democrat and turned green, right? It had been elected as a Democrat and then, you know, got set up with their own party. Um, that's happened occasionally as well. So um, <laughs> they they come from all over. Yep, they sure do. In in some respects. It reminds me of like, I mean, I guess because I think about sports, of like being uh, an expansion team, you know, in a major league. Uh, right. You know, and I've, I've often used that analogy when I've explained the Green Party uh, and its growth. You know, some people have this thing is that like you shouldn't run until you can win. And they don't understand that all the steps in the middle, you know, an expansion team is made up of a few, a few veterans, who moved over from other teams, and at the same time, uh, developing a farm team, uh, to come up, and and then, it takes a few years as as everything develops. Uh, my 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 favorite analogy, and I guess I show my age was. The 1962 Mets, you know, did, 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 you know, would someone say, well, you shouldn't be in the major leagues; you're not capable of winning. And meanwhile, seven years later, in 1969, they were the world champs. And you can't <coughs> predict uh, uh, when that when that will happen in your growth. But the thing is, you have to be in in that major leagues, and you and you have to develop your farm team. Uh, and, and get the mix of talents to fill all the, you know, fill fill the lineup. Uh, so, right. you know, people so have. Think, um, you know, I think we need to do a better job of reaching out to progressive movements and and truly being a part. Um, but you know, I think for many of us, you know, we see ourselves of that those movements. You know that. They're the farm team, if you will, um, cultivating leaders and rallying communities, and you know, speaking truth to power. And at some point, you hit the wall, and there's only so much you can do as an activist. There's a lot you can do as an activist. Don't get me wrong. But at some point, you know, the people making the decisions that affect our lives are the ones who are 
And, you know, for some people, you know, the, the, the next lesson that they're practicing them is the lesson of nothing. And the entire balance line is an animal um, for those, you know, progressive activists who can, you know, make the connection. Yep, yep. That's a. Uh, do you have any thoughts about h how to bridge that specifically? Because that's a, often a very tough thing to to bridge, you know, to get um, the activist into the candidate mode or supporting candidates. Uh, how how is that? How might that be done? I don't think there's a specific answer, uh, yeah. but I think there's a bunch of things that could be done. And and what are your ideas about do how to do that? Well, I think part of it is folks just need some training and some guidance and, and some realization that this is even possible and what does this look like and how it's be done and can you run for office without totally selling your soul and selling your soul. Um, I think that's something that a lot of people are concerned with, you know, like, oh my God, I'm going to raise all this money and who am I going to have to make promises to when um, you know, that whole thing, um, <coughs> yeah, I think, I think we need to do a much better job and, um, you know, explicit, so just to go back to this, you know, we need to frame things where we get people together and say, you know, this is how it's done, this is what I'm like, you know, former cannabis funding, around the country and say, this is how I did it, you know, and that you too can make this transition, but we need to give them some signposts and, and guidance and models of what that looks like them and use themselves, you know, but it happens all the time, um, you know, so it happens yep. in the other parties too, different actions, perhaps, but, you know, it can certainly be done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's. Uh, still waiting. They they keep saying they're going to get on. So Who we'll see. It? You want to keep going? Um, Francisco Herrera in San Francisco, running for mayor. Okay. So for I, I see Miguel Perez. Yeah, so. Could that be? They're accessing. Oh yeah, that's him. Is he here? Oh good. Yep. Miguel. Good. Hello. 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 Do you have video? Yeah. Have no. Um, wait a second. Let me go to the computer and let's see if we can see each other. Okay. Wait a second. Okay. So, Starling, can you tell us uh, a little bit what, what campaign is this? Oh, he's, Francisco is running for city, for mayor of San Francisco as a green, and um, he's a Latino musician, artist. I don't know too much about him, but um, he's been in, he's had quite a bit of media coverage. I wonder. I don't think the polls have closed yet in California. No, it's 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 probably Almost about eight. yep. So. So they might still be in the middle of their in their uh, yeah closing yeah, operation. They probably don't have. To, yeah, they don't have results yet. Yeah. <clears throat> they may have volunteers. But we should probably something. let's wrap it up after we talk to them for a little bit. That's why it's almost 11 for you, right? Yes. yes. Okay, I'm going to try no matter how they're doing. Okay. If we can't get video, we can just audio. Music. Uh -huh. I can okay, okay, we are si si lo puedo como para coordinar, porque ya están aquí.
A ver, ¿cómo podemos hacer para conectarnos a esta dirección? Hoy están conectados, estaban viendo si teníamos imagen. We got another cam. Another computer. Oh, there we go. Miguel, Miguel. ¿No tienes idea cómo se conecta el, el Google? Porque acá tengo una dirección y supuestamente ellos están ahí. Me oh. acabo de comunicar con ellos, pero por el teléfono. Mándatela por Messenger a Facebook y después la copias y la pegas. Pero ellos de, ellos de invitaron, ¿no? Sí. Ahí está. Much going on behind the scenes as we as we as we develop our <laughs> communications path with our next guest. Hello. 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 Yes. We hear you. Uh, Can you hear us? We try to open now your tablet. Oh, there it is. We have video now. We have video now. We can see you. Son estos, es la, esta mujer. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, we can see you. Y el micrófono. El micrófono está bien. Es que si lo prendo, va. va. Ah. ah. Pero yo no veo video de su parte, ahí está. No está Francisco. No, no tenemos. Pero es que el, el dato también no se ve, no se ve muy bien la información porque es un montón de gente. Yo no, creo que alguien más Porque ellos están teniendo discusiones. Ah, no, es nada más que un saludo y más o menos ver lo que está pasando. ¿No tienen Skype? Bueno, yo so, sí, ellos no. So both cameras there's from their location, I see two. Yeah, they got two cameras. Oh, okay. Well, they've got one camera going. They might as well, they can come over and use that one. I don't know which one is which. Yeah. Oh, okay, they have mic and video going. Maybe we should meet the other one so they don't feed back into each other. It's going to be too noisy. I, they have two mics open, so... Okay. Nope. Uh, they lost both. <laughs> uh, I don't think they're going to be able to do it because there's too much background noise. You know, they're, they're, if they're at a party, they're going to have to get to a quiet place. That's too bad. Oh, well, why don't we wrap it up then? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Almost three hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what yeah, do you... We'll have more results tomorrow. <clears throat> so, so what is your sense of, of, of Green Party growth on the supposed off election year? Uh, did you get a... Do you have a feel for... Uh, for how things are, are going? I mean. Well, yeah, like I was saying, I think it's showing um, a lot of good progress that we have, you know, so many candidates, especially on an off year, and there's not elections, you know, everywhere in the country. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we just got to keep doing our outreach, and the CCC is doing, you know, great work, great prep work for next year, and, uh, you know, any folks that are watching, if you want to get involved in our committees, just you know, go to our website and sign up. Let's you know, go to the volunteer page and sign up, and, and we'll get in touch with you. And uh, need lots of help. <laughs> yep, it, it, it's most most. Yep, it's like it's like the sports expansion team 
there may be some veterans here, but we we need youth. We need the uh, younger folks. This. <laughs> whose knees are in a little bit better shape than ours <laughs> right <laughs> right so so then ne our next yep our, our next baton baton holders so it's up to up to you those of you who are, who are watching to spread the word and and uh, consider running for office and and, and recruiting candidates or managing them uh, hopefully tonight has encouraged you uh, uh, you've gained some insight of the diversity of candidates and the diversity of of experience so that you shouldn't be intimidated if you're new to it all uh, just reach out for help from 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 us aging veterans uh, and and experienced candidates uh, to take that plunge uh, and build the Green Party locally, and, and if maybe you, you don't feel you're the candidate uh, to put together a group uh, so that once one amongst you will step forward, uh, it's your party, uh, unlike any other, you know. Some, sometimes yeah it it it, ta it only takes you know four or five people in, in somebody's living room don't ever feel well gee we need hundreds or thousands four or five people and and, and one amongst them runs for, for, for a school board or a town council seat uh, and then you find uh, that by the end of the race, you 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 know you've quadrupled that number in terms of your core group, and you've reached hundreds of people, and that gives you the base for the next for the next run, uh, whether it be the same candidate or you know, it's always a small group of people. Don't ever feel they have so many, we have so few. Uh, Yep. Sometimes knocking on doors, especially in local races, uh, it, it takes time, doesn't <laughs> and it's about time you run again, right? No. <laughs> Portland's probably a much tougher, you know, it's a much bigger city. Uh, yeah, I've, uh, there was a time when, yeah, there was a time when Howie and I were running like every election for, you know, I ran like six or seven times and uh, then life got in the way, but that didn't stop my involvement. I just, uh, channeled it into other ways I could help build the party and that's important to remember uh, pick pick the channel that works for you uh, if you can't do one thing that doesn't mean you, you, you can't do anything it means pick the thing that you can do and 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 the small group of people 
end up putting together the components to build the whole each having their talent, each having their contribution And there are a lot of races like that. There are a lot of races like that across this country. And they're all local mirrors. So with that, uh, I guess we should say good night. Together and hosting, asking good questions. And, and uh, so will this replay, we're doing YouTube for the first time instead of live stream. So we'll have to yeah, thank you, Starly. Uh, I've noticed uh, that there were several bumps in the stream. Uh, so uh, I have a local recording, so I have, I think I'm going to go with that. I'm going to take my local recording, compress it, and, and, and throw it up to YouTube. Uh, it's a long recording, so uh, it, it might not be up there until tomorrow morning, but uh, that's what I'll do. YouTube does its own compression, but I think this is broken up into a bunch of little files, and YouTube doesn't have, a, in my opinion, a great playlist feature. Uh, it has other advantages. Okay. Though. Uh, Should we? So we won't. We don't know. We we'll probably be back on sometime soon. Um, so folks can look on social media and find out when we're going to be back on. Um, so I just have to stay tuned. Shall we fade out and bring up the closing music? <laughs> closing music. I can bring up our closing <laughs> logo. You have a good song. <laughs> <laughs> we are green. Uh, uh, with that, I guess we'll we'll say good night. Uh, good night, Starling. Good night, Craig. Good night, Hillary. Good night. <laughs>